Good morning. I'm so glad you're here with us today. I want to welcome all of you. If you're here in person, I want to welcome everyone from our uh, C3 Colby campus as well as our online campus. Uh, do me a favor if you're watching online this morning, uh, check in with us under the comment section. Just let us know who you are and who you're watching with and even where you're watching from. That just helps us kind of know who is with us today for services. So we are in the midst of this series called Eight Traits. Eight Traits of people who are growing in their relationship with Christ. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. These aren't the only traits of growing Christians, but eight that I chose that I think is important for us to talk about. And, and we did a little switcheroo uh, with our topics. I took week eight and jumped up to week three uh, for, for a purpose that you'll see here in just a little bit. Uh, I wasn't to be here this weekend. Now, Kale did tell me. Uh, Kale uh, is our uh, creative arts director here at Celebration, and he preached last week, and he uh, mentioned last week that he was going to be preaching again this morning. So if you came to hear Kale uh, preach this morning, I'm sorry. This, uh, he did tell me, and he made sure I knew that everyone applauded in the 930 service when he said he was going to be preaching again this weekend. So I hate to disappoint you, but I'm here, and you're stuck with me this morning. Now, what's really ironic about this is this morning's message was originally supposed to be loyalty, Give it a minute. You might just whisper to the person next to you. Here's what he's talking about. I'm just glad you're here this morning. I'm glad to be back early. We've been up in Minnesota. We went on vacation for a week. Uh, my wife and, and I uh, took our daughter and in uh, a mother figure, and, and we went uh, on a cruise that was great. And then we came back and headed straight the next morning to Mayo Clinic uh, with our 19-year-old son, Kelby. We'll talk about that a little bit more today. If you've got your Bible with you, uh, crack it open to the book of Acts. Uh, if you're new to your Bible, that's kind of towards the end of your Bible. It's in the New Testament. Uh, Old Testament, everything before Jesus, New Testament, everything from Jesus' birth on. And we're going to be in the 27th chapter today, and you're going to notice something today. I did not, uh, there, there's a lot of scripture here. I did not have it put on the screen with me today because I'm encouraging you to bring your paper Bible. I've been saying this for a couple of years now. There's something about the feel of a paper Bible, isn't there, in your hands? If you need help with knowing the kind of what kind of Bible to order, if you're somebody that's new to the faith or you've just decided to jump in your faith and you need a Bible, uh, just, just mention it to me after the service. I'd love to give you some ideas of some options that are out there. So in the 27th chapter uh, of the book of Acts, uh, to give you a little bit of background here, you've got Paul. If you go all the way back to like the, the ninth chapter of Acts, Paul, whose name was Saul, or he was known as Saul before this, uh, not King Saul from the Old Testament, Saul of the New Testament, he had an experience where he met the risen Christ uh, in the ninth chapter of Acts. And at that point in time, everything changed. Prior to that, his life mission was to persecute Christians. Now his life mission is to expand Christianity, okay? And, and, and if you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ, everything, hear this, everything is supposed to change. Jesus doesn't want to be compartmentalized in our life. He doesn't want to be part of our life. He wants to be our life. He wants to be a part of every different section, every compartment of our lives. And this is what happens with Paul is Jesus becomes his driving force in his life, not just a part of his life. So He's been preaching the word of God. He's been arrested. He didn't like being arrested the way he was arrested. So he appealed to Caesar or to Rome because he was of Roman descent. And so what he's doing now is he is on a ship as a prisoner and he has been he's being taken to Rome to stand trial for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Okay, so to give you a little background. Now, one more interesting thing to think about here is you'll hear pronouns in here like they and we in here. So this is kind of an interesting weaving back and forth here because we know the author of the book of Acts is Luke, right? Luke is a contemporary of Jesus, not one of the 12 disciples, but he wrote the book of Luke who, that gives us the, the most descriptive account of things like Jesus' birth. And so Luke would have been with Paul 
on this ship, all right? So this is going to read like an action movie, all right? So here we go, starting in the 13th verse, settle in. It says, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they, drew the ship's tackle, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Make a mental note there. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of God, to, of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage up, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when, it, and when at about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You will need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Now, I want to take this account in the 27th chapter of Acts, and I want to point out four very important things that we can draw from this passage. And the first thing that I want you to think about in terms of this is that Paul found himself in a storm that he did not cause. You see, Paul was just being obedient to Christ. He had done what God had called him to do, and he found himself nonetheless in a storm. And I know that there are people here today, people hearing this message today, that you're in a storm in your life. You're in, a, you're in something in your life right now that if you look at it and you say, why did this happen? Now, some of you might say, well, I know why this happened because I did something stupid. That happens in life. Did you know that? that? There are consequences to a lot of the things we do. But I think so often when we're walking with God and we find ourselves in storms, we look at what we think might be the reason and we really can't dredge up anything that we think that we did that caused the storm. This is why it's important for us to go to God, to be in relationship with God on a consistent basis, to ask God, as Psalm 139 talks about, to search our heart and know us and to point out anything in us that doesn't honor him, right? That, that's why it's important for us to go to him with our sin in our life so that when storms in life happen, we can't say, oh, it's because of sin in my life. But the bottom line is this. We are a part of the human condition. 
And because of the human condition, there is sickness, there is death, and the mortality rate in America is 100%. And that means that in our lives, whether we follow God or whether we don't follow God, there are going to be times that we find ourselves in major storms in our lives. Paul was following God and yet he found himself in a storm he didn't cause and maybe you can relate with that. Maybe there's times and maybe that time is now where you're like, I'm in the midst of this difficulty in my life and I didn't cause it. And along with that can very easily come to the point where we feel like this just isn't fair. Do you know David felt that way? You read the Psalms over and over and over again. David said there's 150 Psalms. He wrote about 75-ish of them. Paul, or uh, he talks, David talks over and over again about how things aren't fair. And he cries out to God and he complains to God and, and, and he's not ever afraid to tell God how he really feels. And I just want to encourage you today that if you're in a storm and you're feeling discouraged, it's okay to tell God about that. In fact, I would very much tell you it's important for you to tell God about that. He was a prisoner on this ship. He was shackled part of the time at least. And he was just trying to follow God. Like, wow, I'm trying to trust God, but this situation isn't fair. Here's the second thing I want to point out to you. Paul had moments of hopelessness. Now, I think this is a really important thing for me to talk to you about today. We see here in verse 20, when neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope. Everybody say all hope. We gave up all hope of being saved. It says we. So it's including more than just Paul. But Paul is included in this, that Paul went through a point in time during a storm that he felt hopeless. Now, let me just say this. There is a theology in Christianity out there today that says if you ever feel hopeless or you feel like this isn't going to end, then you must not be a very strong Christian. Well, let me ask you this. Was Paul a very strong Christian? Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Did Abraham follow God? Did he have storms? Absolutely. Did Gideon follow God? Did he have storms? Absolutely. Did he have moments of hopelessness? Absolutely. You look throughout the Bible and you find most of the patriarchs of the faith went through times, Moses is included in this, who felt moments of hopelessness. So don't beat yourself up about that. That also is part of the human condition. We just can't stay there, right? You look at Jesus' own disciples, the 11 guys who were left at this time, and Jesus was crucified. And where did they spend the next week? Hiding. And how were they feeling when they were hiding for those, for the, for those days? Hopeless. Did that mean they didn't love God? No. Did that mean that they didn't love Jesus? No, it didn't mean that at all. It just meant that there are times in our lives when we're going through difficulties that we will have moments of hopelessness. And Paul did as well, and I do as well. The third thing I want to point out to you is that Paul chose to trust in God's promises. Verse 25, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, yeah, God doesn't exactly come to me and say, hey, by the way, don't worry. Don't worry. This storm is going to end tomorrow at 432. Don't worry. Wouldn't that be nice going through storms in our life if God would come to us and say, hey, Brad, just hang on, 16 more days and this will be over. I'll tell you what, I would not feel hopeless very often if God allowed me to put on my Google calendar when the storm was gonna end. Or really, if the storm is going to end. But let me also tell you this, the Bible is full of promises that we can hang on to in those times of storms in our lives. 
you know, one of the most popular verses that you see tattooed on people or on their walls at their houses is Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That sounds really good, only that wasn't written to us. <laughs> that was written to the Israelites who had turned their back on God and God saying, hey guys, you got to figure this out because I got plans for you, but you're screwing it up. It was written by Jeremiah called the weeping prophet. So think about that. You know, hey, Jeremiah, you're going to be my prophet and you're going to just give bad news. Hi, I'm Jeremiah, the bearer of bad news. Wouldn't that be nice to have that title? But we can look at that and we can just throw it out and say, okay, God was talking to the Israelites, but here's the thing. Over and over and over again throughout the Bible, God gives promises to his people who follow him that are the character of God for all of us. Because here's the fact of it. You read the Bible enough, you realize that God does have, have a plan for you. God never promises you that you will live a life that is, that is prosperous in the way that this world says. Because this is when this world says prosperous, you think about prosperity gospel. You all, if you're really walking with God correctly, you'll be rich You'll never have a problem. You'll never be sick. Nobody you love will ever have cancer. And if you do, you're just doing something wrong. I'll tell you what, that's not a gospel you'll never hear. You'll ever hear from this platform because that's a false gospel. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus says, come to me who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest in Matthew chapter 11. In 1 Peter, it says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. These are things that were written to audiences that are God's character. That means that God has that for us as well. So Paul chose to trust in God's promises. And here's a question I have for you today. When you're in the midst of a storm in your life, are you willing to trust in God's promises? Or are you just wanting to focus on what you don't have? We'll come back to that in a little bit. And then the fourth thing I want to talk to you about today is that Paul learned to give thanks even in the midst of the storms. Yeah, we talk about this, you know, we usually thank people after we get a gift, right? We usually thank people when we're given something. And this is kind of counterintuitive when Paul gives thanks to God. So Paul stops. He has this food that they've been saving up. Nobody's eaten for two weeks on this ship. And he says, okay, guys, we're going to have a party. We're going to eat. We're going to thank God for what he's given us. Do you know what Paul didn't focus on? He didn't focus on the storm around him. He, he focused on the blessing that was set before him. And they ate and they got full. And then what did they do? They threw the rest of the food overboard. Talk about an act of faith. Because when they threw that food overboard, there were no more. They had to trust in God's promise that he's going to deliver him because they realized that God was their sustenance, not the food in the bucket. So in the midst of the storm, Paul gave thanks. Let me ask you this. How good are you at that? I can tell you how good I am at it. It's not very good. It says, after he said this, verse 35, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. As I look at this account of Paul in Acts 27, I can't help but think about my life. And, and, and as many of you know who have been part of Celebration for years, you, you know some of the storms that my family has gone through. I, I try to be very open about those things that I can share from the platform about storms in our life, letting you know that we don't live this perfect, wonderful, problem-free lives and as most of you know, our son was diagnosed with a life-threatening brain condition in 2011. His name is Kelby. He's 19 years old now. And after having a stroke at our kitchen table and we took him to the hospital, um, they did an MRI. We went to several hospitals. We saw five, six, seven different neurosurgeons. And they showed us this picture of Kelby's brain. If you want to look at this picture on the screen, I promise it's coming. There it is. On, this is the left half of my son's brain when he was seven years old. And you see all those dark places in there? Those aren't supposed to be there. Uh, that is a nest of veins and arteries that didn't develop correctly in the womb. 
It's called an AVM, arteriovenous malformation. So arteries and veins that are malformed. And blood rushes through there, which causes pressure on these uh, veins and arteries that don't narrow into capillaries. And it can cause brain bleeds, strokes, um, seizures, and for some people, death. And they showed me this, and I knew right when I looked at this picture that this doesn't look like pictures of the brain that I saw in science class. We finally end up at a, at a doctor who says to us, um, you know what I think the solution to this is? I think the solution is embolization. He said, we're going to embolize. And what that means is we're going to go in there with a catheter and we're going to go up into, those, uh, into that AVM and we're going to shoot glue in it which is going to stop blood flow through it, which will cause blood to reroute itself to healthy veins and arteries. And then eventually, kind of like thinking about a heart attack, you know, it's not good when you have a heart attack, right? And what happens in a heart attack is your arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller until blood can't any longer flow through there, right? That's what we were trying to do with the AVM is to get blood not to flow through the AVM. So he said, eventually it will narrow to the point that blood decides to go a different direction and then that AVM will shrivel up and die. And we said, great, let's do it. And he said, okay, let's plan it for two days from now. And so we got it on the calendar and as we talked to him and we had questions, you know, we want to know what the risks are before we go through with this. And he said, well, there's no really way to know exactly what brain functions happen where that AVM is. He said, because everybody's brain is different. And we said, there's no way to tell. He said, well, there's a way to tell, but your son's not old enough for the test that would tell us that. And we said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, your son's seven years old. He said, you, you have to read at the sixth grade level in order to be able to do a functional MRI because it has you think of specific things and read things on a screen and all this stuff. And then this computer shows with pinpoint accuracy what parts of your brain are doing what. And my wife said, I'm a teacher. I just did a reading test on my son a couple weeks ago. He reads at the sixth grade level. And the doctor was like, okay. And my wife said, can we try it? And he said, yeah, we can try it. So they put him in this MRI machine. They do a functional MRI. This embolization was scheduled for two days later. We come out of that. We meet with the doctor and he says, it's a good thing we didn't embolize because if we would have done this procedure, it would have taken away his ability to speak or move the right side of his body. And then as I've shared with you before, his last words that we remember were, take him home and enjoy him while you can. And so we took him home and then through an unbelievable um, series of events um, that, that I, I feel God's right, uh, calling me to write a book about storms in our lives. And, and this will be in there. I'll give you more details about this. But we end up at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in a doctor's office who says, a third doctor that we met there said, we think we can help your son. And so in 2011, at the end of April, um, they did a, a, a procedure uh, called a gamma knife surgery. And what they do is they, they, they screw a head frame onto your skull, and then they screw that head frame onto a table. And then they get five different kinds of doctors in the room, and they look at this AVM, and they decide how much radiation to shoot into that AVM to try to, 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 try to starve it, to try to kill it. And so they go in there, and it's kind of different from what radiation is with, like, cancer, because in this gamma knife procedure, it takes 190 some rays of, of radiation coming from all different directions and they all intersect at one point and that's where the radiation is placed. And so we went through this with him and uh, he handled it really, really well and lost some hair on his head. But other than that, um, he, he was doing pretty good and then he got really emotional with stuff. And so anytime you mess with the brain, weird things can happen. And then finally in July of that year, we, fought, we felt like we were, on the, we were on the right track. Everything was going to be good. And, and then he has six strokes in nine days and just bam, bam, bam. And, you know, every time he'd have a stroke, he'd come running up to us and he'd hit, the, the, the sign was hit me on the arm and I'll know you're having a stroke. And, and he came up and he did that six times in nine days. And, and we were just in this storm and we didn't see how this ever was going to get better. We had a yearly MRI. Um, it continued to shrink, which was good news, but yet the risk of brain bleed um, 
doesn't really differentiate between large and small AVMs. And so we went back in 2015 to Mayo Clinic. They said, we want to do one more gamma knife surgery, um, but that's all we can do. We can only do one more gamma knife surgery. And so we did that in 2015. And then we've had uh, several MRIs. He's had a couple stroke episodes since then. And so we decided, you know, our son's 19. He's ready to get on with life. He's ready to adult. And he said, I just, I need to know if there's anything we can do to get rid of this, the rest of this. And so uh, we went back to Mayo Clinic last Tuesday and, um, and we sat in a doctor's office for two hours, an hour and a half. And we sat in there and, and, and we went through picture after picture after picture and, and just moments of silence of this doctor studying the latest MRI. And then we get done and, and he says, you see this white spot right here? He said, that's just scar tissue. That's nothing to worry about. And we looked at the pictures that he was showing us and it didn't look anything like that picture you saw behind you. All the black was gone. And I said, are, are you telling me that he's healed? And he said, the AVM is completely obliterated. Your son's healed. Yeah. We waited 4,393 days to get verification that our son was healed from a life-threatening condition. 12 years and 10 days from his first stroke. And like Paul, we found ourselves in a storm that we didn't cause. Like Paul, we had moments of hopelessness and admittedly your pastor had a lot of those moments where I just didn't see how it was ever going to end. I remember our, our first trip to Minnesota, we went to Target and we were walking, we were just getting supplies there that we were gonna need in Minnesota and, and, and my wife called me over to a sign that she had seen in the home decor section and it said, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's learning how to dance in the rain. And we kind of took that quote as our mantra for realizing that this is a storm that we're gonna have to walk through and that we can either allow this to completely and totally destroy our lives or we can learn how to dance in the rain and show gratitude to God. Like Paul, we chose to trust in God's promises. And I'll admit to you that a lot of times my faith was pretty puny. And when we'd get an MRI every year for several years and we kept hearing it's smaller, but it's not gone. It's smaller, but it's not gone. It's smaller, but it's not gone. We chose to trust in God's promises. And here's the thing. God never promised that he would heal my son physically from this AVM. But God promises us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He promises us that he's always with us. He promises us that he loves Kelby even more than we're capable of loving Kelby. And I know if you're a parent, it's hard to wrap your mind around the fact that God loves your child even more than you do. But when I came to that conclusion that as much as I love him, God loves him more, it was a whole lot easier to surrender him. When we go through struggles and storms in our lives, it's essential that we trust in God's promises. I've had a conversation with each of our children that went something like this, when they've said, why isn't God answering these prayers? We've got all these things and he's just not answering any of them. Why even pray, Dad? And my answer has been similar with each of my kids saying, we've got two choices. We can walk away from God because we're mad at him or we can lean into God. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to lean into God because he's the only hope. Greg Laurie is a pastor at a church in California 
called Harvest Church. You may have read about Greg Laurie just recently, if you haven't heard him preach on the radio. But Greg Laurie is the, the pastor of Harvest Church. In fact, Greg Laurie is the story behind a movie that just came out this weekend. It's in Hayes' theater, actually, called Jesus Revolution. And it talks about a revolution uh, of Christianity that happened in the hippie scene in Southern California in the 1970s. And, and this story is Greg Laurie's story. Well, Greg Laurie, I was just reading a little bit more about him this week, and he lost a son in a car accident. And, and parents who have lost a child through an accident or something that wasn't expected, that's a different kind of loss um, when it's unexpected and everything rushes in at once. And Greg Glory, I was watching this clip of Greg Glory preaching uh, this week, and he said one thing to remember is that it's important that we don't trade what we don't know for what we do know. It's so important that we don't trade what we don't know for what we do know. He didn't know why his son died in a car accident. He didn't know why God allowed that to happen. You see, the fact of the matter is, whether you think it's fair or not, nothing happens without God allowing it to happen. If God is omniscient, if God is omnipotent, if he is everywhere and if he is all powerful, that means that nothing happens without God allowing it to happen. Doesn't mean he makes it happen. Read the book of Job, you'll see that very clearly. But nothing happens without God allowing it to happen and Greg Laurie will never have the answer of why God allowed his son to die at such a, a young age in his early 20s. But he said, we can't trade what we don't know for what we do know. So let me ask you this. What are those things that you struggle with in your faith that you don't know? And does that take more of your thought? Does that take more of your time than focusing on what you do know? You know, when the dust all clears, here's what I do know. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm good not because I try to live a life with as little sin as possible. No, because I trust in Jesus Christ and I want to be more like him. And I know that if that's the case, I'm promised eternity in heaven. Here's what I do know. There's no pain in heaven. Here's what I do know. Everyone will be healed in heaven who has a relationship with Jesus on earth. Here's what I do know. The Bible tells us there's no crying. It tells us in the book of Revelation, there's no, no crying, no pain, no loss, no sickness, none of that. That's what I do know. And if I can promise or if I can focus on that promise of heaven, of eternity, then I can weather the storm no matter how long the storm happens on earth. We received a huge victory this week. My family still has at least two very major storms in our lives going on right now. We're awaiting a murder trial um, for our niece. And, and our 21-year-old son struggles with severe mental illness. And those are storms that are raging. But we have a choice to make. Are we going to allow those other storms to overshadow the victory that we have seen this week? And I'll tell you the answer is going to be no. Yesterday morning... I was feeling so much gratitude for what God had, has done. And my plan was to get up yesterday morning and to go up to my office study and, and to open up my study Bible and to study the Word of God. And I just kind of felt a nudge from God. It wasn't a, a, a verbal message. I just felt a nudge that, that I needed to just spend time in Jesus' presence, not just studying my Bible. And so instead of grabbing my, my big, thick study Bible or one of those and sitting at my desk and studying the Word of God, I grabbed a Bible about this size that was up on my bookshelf. I've got probably 30 Bibles, and I grabbed it. I haven't opened this Bible in years. I used to use it for weddings and funerals because it was small. And I pulled it off of the shelf, and I went downstairs, and I sat down on this round chair we have in our living room. And I just sat there. Before I even opened my Bible, I just sat there, and I looked out the window. And I was feeling so much gratitude. And I was watching the birds outside, and I was just thanking God. And I was feeling more gratitude than I have felt in years. 
And then I kind of came to and said, okay, I'm going to open up the Word of God. I opened up my Bible. And you know, you know if, you, if you're somebody who stuff, stuffs notes and stuff in your Bible or papers or bulletins or, or, or funeral things or whatever, I open up my Bible and there's a note card sitting right in the middle of Psalms in my Bible. And I pull out that note card and I was getting ready to read my Bible and I just looked down at the note card. It was a bright green, fluorescent green note card. And at the top of the note card, it said, Kelby's AVM. October 17th, 2012. And I read this as yesterday morning. And I read it. And it said, Lord, you are the master healer, merciful and just. Thank you for the shrinking of the AVM. For Mayo Clinic, for Dr. Pollock, who's the neurosurgeon, for financial blessings through this process, and for complete healing. That was 3,800 days or so before we got the news that he was healed. I'm going to close with Lamentations chapter 3. If you're someone who finds yourself in a storm, this is the same person that I was talking about a little bit ago, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who started chapter three of Lamentations. If you're in a storm, storm, please write down Lamentations three. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just a few verses here. But the beginning of the chapter, he's just lamenting to God about how horrible his life is. And then here's what he says, starting in the 19th verse to the 24th. He says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for your healing. Even more than physical healing, thank you for the spiritual healing that you offer us, all who call on your name. And Lord, if there is anyone here today who doesn't have a relationship with you or who hasn't been close to you in years, Lord, may today be the day they say, Lord, I'm realizing that you are my hope in this life full of storms. I give you praise. And I give you my life in Jesus' name. Amen.